Hi, I'm Jens Larsen, and you're listening to In Time. Hi, guys. Welcome back to another episode of In Time. Today, we're joined by the legendary jazz guitarist and YouTuber, Jens Larsen. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an honor to have you on. Um, I mean, both me and Amir have been uh, big fans of the content for years now, and obviously, it's you know got a pretty big following on Instagram as well. Um, I guess the first thing I'd like to ask before we you know really get into it is how did you... You know, when did you first decide to, to, to start this presence online? Um, well, I mean, I was, uh, I'm, I'm in a band that actually is not really a band at the moment. We're taking a break called uh, Trapping. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that people were visiting my website for the transcriptions that I had on there. So it's like, oh, I'll make some more content. But I didn't only want to put transcription up there. So I started putting some lessons. But then if you just put some lessons on a website, then nothing happens. And I've, I've tested that theory quite thoroughly and um, then I needed somewhere to share it and then I found this pretty horrible website called Ultimate Guitar <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, we're and then I, started, then I started posting them there and um, they were still just like articles and blog articles and stuff and I would just post them on, on Ultimate Guitar but they got received really well and there were a few people on Ultimate Guitar uh, that I still have contact with that are also YouTubers and uh, mostly that was um, Ben Eller and Chris Super. I don't know if you know them, but um, especially Chris was really saying like, well, you're making really nice lessons, but you, you have to make video. But that works just way yeah. better. And then, uh, then after he said that 10 times, then I was like, okay, I'll just take my phone and then try and make a really awkward lesson. And then I just kept on going, making awkward lessons until they became less awkward. And, and that's, that's, I mean, it, it was in the beginning, it was just sort of to go, well, I, I know people find my website and come to the gigs and stuff. And then once I started making lessons, it also became clear to me that there were, there were things in how I was taught that weren't really, I didn't see them anywhere. It was like, they didn't really become a mainstream part of what was taught. And I really wanted, they really helped me. So I really wanted to bring those out. So the, the first lessons are really about that a lot. Uh, and of course, I, I don't, do that all the time but that's still what i'm trying to do is just to find a more clear way to explain things and give people a better way of learning that's that's a little bit more logical because very often i think jazz still is so young and music education is so young yeah that we just teach stuff as if it's, if it's magic it's just like oh yeah but uh your timing sucks go practice with a metronome see you in eight years you know it's like Who's, what, what's that going to help? You know, so, so, so just be more sort of specific and find better ways to practice, better ways to explain. And also um, what I find more and more, um, finding ways of, of teaching so that, and explaining so that it fits with what you hear. That's also sort of been a, a thing that I found later. I was explained all sorts of stuff, but it didn't really fit with how the music sounded to me. So, so that, that was sort of been the mission for me, I think. I guess, um, you know, being like an online music teacher, I guess, uh, through YouTube. Do you ever think it's possible to teach discipline and work ethic in the same way that you can teach theory and techniques? Because that's something that like, it's down to the individual, right? If they want it or not. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I think you can teach a lot. I actually do also look at uh, like the people that I check out when I'm making videos and that are not just guitar channels or music channels are very often about productivity and uh, work ethic and stuff like that and, and how they work with it. And there are things in that that, that you can probably move over to, to teaching music. But I think, I mean, in the end, a YouTube video will never replace a real lesson because you're never going to get any feedback. You're never going to have... One thing is if I play something in a video, it might sound nice and I can do it with a backing track or something but it's never gonna have the impact of being in the room and then I'm really like, okay, you need to sound like this and then I'll play something. That's just gonna be so much stronger that, that you can't replace that. And also just saying, okay, I, when I'm playing with you, I can feel that this is happening or I, yeah, I, can, I can give you some response and some feedback that's just, it's just not happening online. So in that way, I, I'm not, yeah, I think there, there are things in, in that that you can really take over and there are also just a lot of things that belong in one-on-one -on -one lessons. Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, t taking it back to uh, jazz as well, um, as a young musician coming up in the scene, would you say that it's more valuable to, 
you know, I mean, well, you see, you see all these products that you can buy, and it's you know a book of fifty jazz licks and how to play over a two five one and things like that. Um, people seem to forget about learning the riff. Um, and wh- which one would you say is more valuable? You know, having a fantastic arsenal of licks that you can play over most tunes, or just knowing the repertoire inside out. Well, I mean, if you want to do gigs, then you need to know the songs. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that, you know. And so, and also, I found for me, I learned more from from learning songs and just playing other songs. I did also already when I was studying, I was doing a lot of like sideman stuff and comping singers and vocal lessons and uh, and just playing a ton of uh, for a ton of people and exams and stuff like that. So in that way, you really get exposed to the fact. Okay, I just need to know the songs, and if I know the song it's easier for me and it's also I can just play better than if I'm reading it so in that way you you kind of realize okay I need to I need to learn the repertoire and that's going to get me further and then what licks you you know I mean you always need to work on your vocabulary but yeah. I don't think like a lot a lot of licks is not it's not really what it's about when, when you're soloing because there are so much more to a good solo than what you're playing it's also about what order you're playing it and how you build it up uh, dynamics how you're reacting to the people around you and i think you learn that better by repertoire yeah and i mean i guess that's i mean completely understandable would you say there's a way to measure when you can call yourself a jazz musician you know is there a certain skill level a certain knowledge of the repertoire or just knowledge of harmony that you can officially say that i'm a jazz guitarist yeah that's, that's difficult because there are people i mean i think there are a lot of people who i would consider jazz guitar players who don't really have a huge repertoire in terms yeah. of because what, what we talk about then is like oh but then you need to know uh, three rhythm changes heads and uh, 15 blues and f's and, and all the 60 standards i don't know something and then i mean there is something to be said for that and if you're if you're trying to learn how to become a jazz player and you never check that out that might be a good place to go you know it might be relevant but at the same time there are lots of players who don't really have that repertoire i also had teachers who didn't have a huge repertoire but they could just play the songs they knew really, really well. Uh, and they could play their own music really, really well. And that's, that's okay too. I don't think it's in that way something that's going to be uh, what, what makes you a jazz musician. And also, um, I don't know how that was. Like when I was studying, I don't know how it is now, but when I was studying, then there was a huge divide between the teachers. Because I'm pretty convinced that half the teachers didn't really think that the other half were actually jazz musicians. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, so there's, there's always going to be a little bit uh, friction there. I, yeah, I'm not sure if it's easy to say. I, w- I have opinions on it, but it's going to be from person to person, probably. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, it's like what you just mentioned about the teachers. That's like a uh, prime example of just like musician's ego, right? Especially in the jazz world where jazz is, uh, for some, some people, consider jazz to be like the elite level of music um, and the harmony and practice of it. Uh, but I guess from a, uh, a a teaching point as well, there's a, uh, you mentioned it before. There's an you you you'll get more value out of a teacher in person than you will from a YouTube lesson, right, or an online video, because it's not uh, you don't get live feedback or anything like that. But there's a certain balance of being able to teach yourself, or you know, so like having knowing what you want to personally look at and knowing what your teacher wants you to look at. Um, would you like i i'd sort of consider that balance of like 50 50 but is that like a fair assumption to, or a fair assessment to make well i think that really depends on on um on both the teacher and the student um i, I think i've seen i mean it's again one of those things where it's like i know i know uh, teachers that have forced their students to only study bebop until like music didn't exist after 62 you know but that usually doesn't do anything good. And when they when they want people to do that, then it's because the student is not really interested in it. So usually that's that's ending up in a huge disaster. And at the same time, <clears throat> same time you can all, you can also have students who really want to do one thing, but they really need to work on other things that are just so fundamental. It's like you need to go back and also work on this. So if you're not spending two thirds of your time fixing this and you're playing, then you might not be able to hear it right now. But you're just heading for a huge disaster. So. Yes, again, it's, it's like really, I find it really difficult to sort of set really clear boundaries. I think it's really good to be flexible. I think the best, if you're a student, the best way to approach this is to just say, well, okay, my teacher wants me to do this. So 
there's gonna be there has to be I have faith enough in him or her to to just follow what's going on, but I'm gonna do my own thing next to it. I think a lot of students, and that's, I've seen that with my own students, but I also see it with uh, with my colleagues when I was studying, that sometimes you can get caught up in no, but I know what I want, and I'm an artist, and I want to develop this, and they tell me I have to do something else, and then they don't want to do that, and then you have this whole year or two of study that's just one long conflict and that's like nobody's getting any better from that so so it's good to be relaxed enough to also say okay well if they want me to work on that i'll work this much on it you know so in that way the 50 50 thing is just like okay let's be real they might have a reason let's just try and do it i guess i guess similar to that effect as well you've got i mean a lot of musicians nowadays uh or even a lot of new music being written it's using a lot of borrowed concepts from jazz standards, jazz music. Uh, not necessarily to say that they own that level of theory and the, those practices, but are you? Uh, what do you make of things like neo uh, neo soul, like alternative R and B, like like fusion and stuff like that, where they're all borrowing these principles and reapplying them in completely different ways? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's great that there's music that the music is evolving. Whether it's yes or not, that's 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 then uh, sometimes the question. I think I think there are some new soul that's that's definitely have has very little to do with jazz, but there's definitely yeah. also a lot of that really has a lot to do with jazz, and where the people playing it obviously are good jazz musicians. So, um, and I think it's important that that music doesn't stand still. Jazz was always moving to keep to have the idea that that jazz should move along. That that's that's not a that's not a useful thing. I think music is something that's alive. It's always evolving. It's always changing. And there are always going to be like different paths it's going to take. It's, it's going to go in different ways. Um, and New Soul and Fusion are just two of them. There are other things happening at, at the same time as well. And I think that's, that's, that's fine with me, actually. I think, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like I like almost all genres of music, but I don't like everybody in a genre. So it's like, I like some new soul stuff really a lot because I think it's just like really groovy and the way it is, it's, it's really nice uh, to, to listen to in that way. Um, but not everything. <laughs> Same goes for metal, I mean, <laughs> or blues. So it's like, yeah. No, that, that makes um, a lot of sense. I guess with, uh, uh, well, music scene as a whole, then uh, we've got a lot of child prodigies that are much easier to sort of get their attention. They, they, they have a much easier time getting attention just because of the internet, social media and everything like that. Do you think um, music's starting to become more and more of a young man's game? Yeah, yeah, I guess this actually, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think we all have chances to, to start later and also get some attention uh, you just have to find the right way to do it. Obviously, if you're like, I mean, ironically, I teach at a young talent school. So my students are like between 12, 12 and 18 for a big part of them. And they just play like jazz. You know, they're, they're what with somebody who's doing like also kind of heavy pieces. So, um, but but they're not that active on social media yet, I think. And I, yeah, I mean, that's that's also just something that's sort of coming along and we have to adapt to how that's going to work but at us at some point at, um it's all going to be so much like like classical prodigies just don't stand out as much because there are so many of them and that's simply just because the educational system is so much better and uh, there are so many young talent schools that fantastic violin players are just a dime a dozen and it's just going to be a bit matter of time before that's also already if it isn't already the, the case actually with um, with other styles, especially jazz. So in that way, I mean, jazz is becoming and music is becoming more of a, a young man's game. You have a you have an advantage if you use that the right way. But then if you're older, then you just leverage other things. I think. Yeah, I mean, we we spoke to um, I don't know if you're familiar with Domi and JD Beck. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we we spoke to those guys yesterday, and one of the questions I asked was um. A lot of people, you know, are, are big fans of music and they enjoy playing music. But, you know, if they're if they're a bit later in on in life, then they feel it's too late to pursue a music career, which which I don't personally agree with. I think any age is just do whatever you like. And 
they both agreed with that. And I think when you've got such an amazing community online, like on YouTube and social media, there's really no holding you back anymore. It's the best time to take risks. It's the best time to, to go for music. And it's just a perfect time for anyone, you know, starting in the industry today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there are different, um, like everything else, there are positives and negatives in, in that thing yeah, because it's, it's true, you know, we can start ourselves. We don't need to be approved by a record company or, um, or in that way sort of be in, in a scene because we can just build our own audience online. I think that that's definitely something that's been for me, of course, obviously really useful. Yeah. And, um, and for a lot of other people also where, where maybe for the music that we make just immediately didn't get, get us nearly that much attention. So, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's just figuring out like how to use it the right way. And then also that it has to fit with what you want to do. I happen to like teaching so I can easily do what I do, but if you don't like teaching, then don't do what I do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a big community of obviously on YouTube as well. You, like, like you mentioned before, you've worked with people like Chris Zuba, who I'm a massive fan of. You know, he was he was the guy that he was the guy that I used to turn to to learn the metal solos back in the day. Um, what's it like being involved in that community? You know, having such an active stream for collaboration, pretty much whenever you like. Um, well, I don't think I have that active. Um, I don't really do that many collabs. I've done a few. Yeah. I mean, and actually, if I get the chance, then I will do them. I find it difficult to like to work with Chris because because I know Chris quite well. Then it's like, but we have so different audiences. Yeah. You know, the things that I take for granted from my audience, he's just like, what is this science fiction? You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but of course they know a major scale. They know them in all twelve, uh, and they know them in all twelve keys and all positions. But he's just like, they never heard of a major scale. So actually, yeah, we were on a podcast together one time where that that conversation came up. But yeah, so. So it's difficult in terms of, of, of making um, a collaboration that really w makes a lot of sense. Beyond, of course, that we just want to sometimes play stuff together and, and that's fun and, and talk together. But I think with him, it's mostly just hanging out. And otherwise, it's just going to be um, collaborations that are a little bit uh, closer to home. Um, I, I hope actually that I'll be doing something with uh, Justin Seneco in the next few months we've been talking about that and um, I don't know for me actually the thing that really was a huge thing for me was that this year I, I went to NAM and I got to meet a lot of the people that I <clears throat> had contact with and that I worked with uh, yeah. only online and also a lot of people that I just watched on YouTube so that was that, that was really a huge thing just to make it <clears throat> really make it real that you meet it's just so different when you really meet people I think was that your uh, first NAM uh, trip yeah and it might be the last one, eh? <laughs> oh, I know. Well, myself and Joe were planning on going to Nam next year, and we're just looking at okay, let's try and plan it out now. It's like oh, it's cancelled. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's good, isn't it? Um, I guess something else that I want to chat to you about is your band slash project, uh, Traben. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Traben. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, what's what's the meaning behind the band name? Is it a, a Dutch word? No, uh, it's a Danish word, actually, uh, because, I mean, I live in Holland, but I'm actually Danish. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, no, actually, it means peg leg in, uh, in Danish. Peg leg? Yeah, like oh. pirate, yeah. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, that. And, and that came out of having really a lot of trouble finding a name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just then, that. Okay. Uh, two of the band members, so me and the saxophone player, are both Danish, and... Um, we were playing another with another band we were playing a gig and the bass player was there as well and then i was talking to the saxophone player and for some reason the bass player just we were talking about a statue and i was saying that he had this peg leg which is topping and the the the, the bass player just thought that was a really funny name so we took that because we we kind of already had an album recorded the first album recorded we just didn't have a band name yet sweet so that was, that was kind of how that... That sounds out. perfect. I mean, like, how did you find uh, playing music that you probably uh, composed yourselves and written compared to playing standards? Where, where does the preference lie? I think for me, it's actually just, it's like two different things. Um, 
it, be, well, it became two different things a little bit because the music of Traveling was in part, uh, at least the last album, much more arranged. And I could feel that when we toured that because we, we did a few tours in Europe and we also did one in Canada. And um, it became a little bit um, sort of a prison. It was kind of hard to get out of it. It's a little bit like some of the songs that the people, if they'd heard the album, then they remember those songs. And I kind of had found like sort of the, the ultimate way of playing the solo. It's not exactly the same, but there were just some things I was always doing and I got really tired of that. And I couldn't find something that was equally good that I could have replaced it with. And that became sort of a, a struggle. But I think in general, with Rabin, we actually tend to um, interpret the material just like we interpret standards. So, so we try to have it really open in the solos that we can really still be free with it and, 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 um, and go in different directions. Uh, the drummer and me are really both fans of, of taking it different places live also. Yeah. And, and that's been, that's what makes it, that's really what I like. A lot of what I like about playing jazz is the interaction. So, Definitely. yeah, so, so this whole idea that you can suggest a groove and then suddenly we're just going there is, is fantastic for me. And also that I can get that back that, that, that the drummer or the bass player will take a 6-8 and turn it into a 4-4 four, four, or, you know, that we can just do all these things. All the, all the, for me, it's always been the, the Miles Davis second quintet that I was sort of referencing for that. Those are the ones that I, I really hear do this a lot. And, and I think we approached it a lot like that, but the last album, because it had a lot of rock influences and stuff, we got a little bit boxed in in some places and we had, had some trouble sort of opening some of those tunes up. But we always, when we played live, we always played sort of the whole repertoire. So there were always songs that were like more jam session like. That sounds like it'll be quite fun just doing that live. You just let yourself, let, let it rip almost don't you, on, on stage when it's more of a jam session environment. And like, it's probably just takes a bit of the stress away from, you know, playing on a, a live set. But I guess from the, the sound that uh, Traben sort of produces, I was just having this discussion with Joe just before you'd uh, come onto the call, come onto the call with um, uh, whether it's contemporary jazz or like jazz fusion. I mean, what, what would you class your music as? Is it a conscious decision you make as you're writing it? Um, I think the, so, so there are three Traben albums and they're all, really different um the first one is is mostly arrangements of traditional scandinavian folk music wow, okay. the second album is more like um more like just contemporary mainstream jazz things yeah. i think and then the third album is coming out of a period where i was really trying to explore how to mix some of the rock things that i like uh with um with the jazz that I like, a little bit, if you can say it like that. So I was really exploring like other ways, of just not playing really complicated chords, trying to comp with riffs uh, and using other textures and other grooves. That, that was sort of the thing I was really passionate about with that album for a big part. And I think what's different is for me was, it's never, it's never been what I would consider fusion, but my, my picture of fusion is very much sort of like the uh, 80s Frank Ambada, Goldsworth, you know, those kind of things. And it's, it's just not like that because it's, it's much more acoustic sounding and small and, um, and the harmony is different because the harmony of, of more fusion is usually really modal and then um, extended chords so, and, and sustained chords in that way. And, and, and somehow what we're doing there is, is rarely like that. It's much more moving harmony, but it's just, a lot of triads and a lot of uh, yeah so yeah it's, it's a very different kind of harmony to me at least and then also because I don't really play a, a huge part of what I consider fusion is a blues influence and I don't really play with that on that album. Right. Yeah. Think, yeah. No, that, that makes that makes a lot more sense, I guess. And uh, yeah, so uh, I suppose before we before we let you go, I know you've um, you've uh, are you gigging tonight with uh, Trabben? Or are you? No, I'm playing. Um, I'm playing with a big band. Actually, I'm, I'm uh, shopping oh, cool. for a big band, so I have like, uh, like a <laughs> bunch of sheet music that I yeah. was just going over. Not fun. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, no. We, I was. Um, it's so weird because I have. I mean, I played what 
uh, until now two gigs in the last six months, oh, something like wow. that, two or three. <laughs> and then um, I played yesterday, I played a trio gig that was just standard. Um, and, then to, and then I also had a four hour rehearsal with the big band and now I need to check on out and stuff and then I need to go drive to go to that, uh, that show. Uh, tonight we we need to run through a few things also still so because it's it's the it's a very it's a big band that almost never rehearses but the music is really difficult and I'm just a <laughs> oh, soft, wow. so uh, there's a lot of work for me but well, it's um, really fun. Which standard are you looking like forward to the most? Oh sorry. Oh, sorry. Go on. Oh yeah, which standards are you looking forward to the most tonight? Standards. Yeah. Uh, to, well, actually, I think we're almost playing. No, no, that's not true. We're playing You'd Be So Nice to Come Home Soon. That, that's actually one of my favorites. But this is, I mean, when it's arranged, um, I like the You'd Be So Nice to Come Home Soon, but I really need to practice. There's some diminished runs in that arrangement that I really need to practice before tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, so it's, that's exciting, or I hope I make it. And we're also playing um, We'll Meet Again in 5-4. Nice. Oh, so nice. uh, I had to read that as well. But yeah, I mean, it, it's fun to do. There's, there's a lot of different stuff. This is a project. Uh, that they're doing with uh, also a lot of World War One music and World War One themes. There's there's okay. some story around it with that as well. Um, and then there's also because it's an Amsterdam big band, there's some modern classical stuff in there, and there's also some free jazz in there. So it's wow. really mixed. It's really fun to do actually. So how how is Amsterdam at the moment? With obviously, I mean, the world's been a crazy place for the last um, six months or so. Is is Amsterdam pretty much back to normal now? Um, well, I don't live in Amsterdam, so, so I'm not entirely sure, but I would say they were opening up a little bit and then everybody got scared because they got so many tur tourists. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, and right now things are not sort of really going the right way in Holland. Yeah. Um, so everything is sort of closing down. Like um, yesterday I heard that the conservatory in Rotterdam, like we have three big conservatories in, in, in uh, the Netherlands. So we have The Hague, Amsterdam and Rotterdam. And, um, Rotterdam, they had in the opening week, <laughs> in the middle of the opening speech where all the new students are sitting in the in the hall, one of them got an email like, oh, you have corona. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> so they closed the school for two weeks. <laughs> oh, so yeah, that's uh, that, that, that's what, how that's going here. So it, I don't know. I think in Amsterdam, they're really uh, strict at the conservatory. And I think they're also getting really strict with sort of clubs and, and, and bars to, to keep people apart and stuff. But yeah. Um, I, I think right now we're kind of waiting for it to be shut down a little bit, taken back a bit here. I think that's coming. Definitely. No, I, th I think um, you got to enjoy it while it's last, like in terms of the gigs that you, you do have. And you, you're quite, uh, I suppose, in a way, you're quite fortunate enough to have some gigs where I think a lot of people have just cancelled tours and everything like that. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. That's, I mean, I'm. Uh, I'm envious of that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it was also like that for me, like, like, you know, in the middle of March, then I could just start pulling things out of the, the calendar. And then it kind of started to come back when they opened the schools here in June. Okay. Um, and then I started to get some stuff in, but that also just fell off because then they tightened the amount of people that could be in a venue and then you couldn't play there anyway. And, so, and that's also like how it is tonight. We're playing in a hall that actually holds 1,500 people. It's sold out, but that's only 300 people. Oh, wow. That's so, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's really difficult. That's uh, and, and I'm curious how that's, that's going to be. Actually, yesterday in the, in the club that I played, it was pretty okay with the amount of people and people. Well, but they were not keeping distance, though. So you don't have the one and a half meter thing happening. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, yeah. No, so hopefully, um, hopefully everything goes goes back to normal, ASAP. And uh, have I wish you the best of luck for your big band gig tonight, <laughs> or, uh, and rehearsal. Um, make sure you land those diminished runs. But thanks for uh, coming <laughs> on, Jens. Yeah, uh, th thanks for having me as a guest. What's coming up in the next few months? Is there anything you'd like to announce or promote? Um, well, I mean, I have actually to right now that we're recording this tomorrow. My first online course is coming out. Wow. So that's a new thing okay. that I've been working on a lot. That kind of works well with Corona. You have time to work on stuff like that. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's not there's not not really uh, much else we uh, we've got to cover. So we'll 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 let you go. Um, and if 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 you fancy coming on again another time, then we'll definitely be more than happy to accommodate.